Great. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, the 27th meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, Monica Lennon has sent her apologies, and I'd like to welcome Polly McNeil uh, to the meeting as her substitute. And I'd also like to welcome Dave Torrance back uh, after being off for, uh, for a few weeks. I'd like to welcome also Jean Freeman, the Minister for Social Security, and her officials uh, to the meeting. And it's proposed that uh, the committee takes items 8, 9, 10 and 11 in private. These items are the consideration of the committee's approach to the Police Act 1997 and the Protection of Vulnerable Groups Scotland Act 2007 Remedial Order uh, 2018. The Scottish Government's response to the committee's questions on the delegated powers provisions in the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill the contents of the committee's report to the Equalities and Human Rights Committee on the Delegated power, uh, Powers in the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill, and the evidence it will hear from the Minister on the Social Security Scotland Bill this morning. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay, thank you. Okay, the next item of business is the consideration of the, the Social Security Scotland Bill. The Minister is here to speak to us about the Bill and I would like to welcome the Minister and Chris Boyland, and the Legislation Team Leader uh, of the Social Security Police, uh, Policy Division, uh, Fraser Goff, the Parliamentary Council, and Colin Brown, the Senior Principal Legal Officer of the Scottish Government. And I believe that the Minister would like to make an opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, and can I uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be at committee and I hope answer your questions uh, productively. Uh, I thought it might be helpful to begin by outlining the thinking behind the government's approach to our bill. We've brought this bill to Parliament with a track record of positive engagement with stakeholders and all those with an interest in ensuring that our future social security system works well. It is by keeping the interests of those who will use the system, advise on the system and operate the system foremost in our minds that we have come to take the approach that we have taken in our bill. The UK government's approach has been to put their benefit rules partly in primary legislation, while at the same time also requiring that their primary legislation has to be read alongside further rules in subordinate legislation. In our view, this makes the UK legislation confusing, difficult to follow and open to different interpretations. By contrast, putting the detailed rules for the operation of our devolved benefits into subordinate legislation allows us to make our legislation clearer and more accessible. It will also ensure that our legislation is flexible enough to deal with changing circumstances. Generally speaking, I'm pleased that the stakeholder community has acknowledged the logic in this approach and the reasoning behind it. For example, citizens as Vice Scotland have said in their submission to the Social Security Committee that they accept the Scottish Government's view that setting out some of the rules for the new benefits should be made in regulations. Much of the important detail affecting the operation of the Social Security system is contained in regulations and guidance which are regularly issued and updated. In recognition of the part that secondary legislation will pay, play in our overall approach, we've made a commitment to produce illustrative versions <laughs> of some of the regulations which we will make under the bill. And I'm pleased to say that we've already begun to honour that commitment. Committee members will have received the illustrative drafts of our planned Best Start grant regulations last week, along with a briefing paper which explains the policy intent behind the regulations. These make clear how we intend to use these powers, both specifically in terms of the Best Start grant, but also more generally in terms of our indicative approach to drafting regulations across the piece. I've also been mindful, given the emphasis that we intend to place on co-production and developing all of our constituent parts in the overall system in collaboration with others, of the need to ensure that regulations are considered in an open and transparent way that allows stakeholders to provide evidence and feed in their views. That is why we have produced these illustrative regulations, so that the wider public and the stakeholder community can see what we intend to do with the powers under the Bill. 
It's also the reason why, with the exception of a small number of areas which mostly deal with administrative matters, that regulations will be made under the Bill will be subject to the affirmative procedure to allow for full scrutiny by the Committee. And I would, I'd like to say a little bit more about scrutiny, if I may, and before I finish. I have been consistently clear in my discussions with stakeholders for some time now that I believe there is a need for independent expert scrutiny of social security matters in Scotland. And I'm happy to make that point clear once again. So if we are agreed on the need for scrutiny, then the next question is about when we should be scrutinising. How do we ensure that the right people are involved at the right stage to deliver the most value? In my view, the absence of this represents a failing in the current UK arrangements that we should correct. The statutory rules at UK level, which currently govern the work of the advisory committees, mean that regulations only come to the existing committees after they have been drafted, with a number of exceptions which allow the Secretary of State to circumvent the committee's involvement and the committee's advice is provided to the government, not to the Parliament. This isn't the only difference between what currently is the case at a UK level and what will happen in relation to our devolved social security system. It's likely that there will also be a difference in the volume of regulations to be scrutinised. When Professor Grain McKeever gave evidence to the Social Security Committee on the 14th of September, she said that the UK Social Security Advisory Committee had scrutinised 44 pieces of legislation in the previous year. This is a significant volume, but it's not directly comparable to what will happen in Scotland once the initial sets of regulations to establish the new system have been made. My advisor's estimate of the instruments considered by the UK Advisory Committee in 2016-17, only around four or five would fall within devolved competence. So if you have a commitment to involve stakeholders and experts, and you are dealing potentially with a lesser volume of regulations that allows you some time and space to submit regulations to a full and detailed scrutiny process, then the next question is who exactly should provide this scrutiny? I've been clear that I don't think this is a question that the Scottish Government can answer on its own. It's not for us to decide how our proposed legislation should be scrutinised. It does feel to me a bit like marking our own homework. So this is what I've done so far. I've met with the convener of the Social Security Committee back in May to ask her and her members to consider what role the Parliament should play in filling the space left by the existing UK advisory committees. And I have since written to Dr Jim McCormick, the chair of our expert advisory group on disability and carers' benefits, to ask him to set up a short-life working group from amongst his members to consider how scrutiny of social security matters should work as part of our new Scottish system. I have asked for an initial response from him in line with what I understand to be the timetable for the drafting of the Social Security Committee's Stage 1 report. I think it's important that the expert group's initial findings should, if at all possible, be taken into account at this stage in the parliamentary process. As Jim outlined to the Social Security Committee on the 21st of September, the expert group plans to engage with the Social Security Committee and also the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, and I'd be interested to hear from members today if you feel that the DPLRC could also make a contribution to that work. Once these various groups and bodies have had an opportunity to consider the matter, I expect to be able to say more on how we will ensure that expert scrutiny is built into the system later on during the bill process. In all of this, I'd ask that we don't lose sight of the real prize. The prize is a system that works in the best interests of all those who depend on that. To do that, we need scrutiny arrangements which are expert-led, open-minded and forward-looking, that drive improvements in the system and make things better. And by the end of this parliamentary process, I hope that this is what we will have in place. 
My thanks to you, convener. I'm very happy to take questions that members may have. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, uh, for that uh, comprehensive uh, opening statement. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, you'll have uh, touched upon uh, many of the areas of questioning uh, that, uh, that we'd like to uh, put to you. But there's, uh, th there are st a few questions, and certainly um, the, the number of respondents to the Social Security Committee's call for evidence in the Bill have expressed concern about the, the uncertainty created by not including on the face of the Bill detail about the eligibility and what will be provided for each of the types of assistance. And in light uh, of these concerns, have you given any consideration to including more information on the face of the bill? Thank you. We've designed the bill to give flexibility for policy development, both now and in the future. But we've also used a framework that allows Parliament to control what is provided as it sees fit. It is important, I think, to keep in mind that the schedules are not aiming to define individual benefits. They are the framework within which benefits will be designed. For some types of assistance, there will be more than one benefit. For example, disability assistance covers currently four benefits. So working within this framework, we intend to design to co-design policy for our new social security system working with those who have lived experience of the existing system. That is where the role of our social security experience panels, which involve over 2,400 people, come into play. People who have recent experience of receiving benefits to help us develop our policies and to design and test a new system to ensure it works for them. Alongside the experience panels, we have our Disability and Carers Benefits Expert Advisory Group, chaired by Dr McCormick, which I've just referred to. And by putting those things together, I'm confident that we can come up with the right policy solutions at the right time to ensure the safe and secure transfer of benefits to those who receive them and deliver our overall ambition. And to go back to the first part of your question, Part of the reason that some UK social security legislation is so confusing is that certain rules are put up front in the primary legislation, reflecting the views that were held when the legislation was made. But then as things have moved on and perhaps new governments have been elected, secondary legislation has been made which qualifies or undercuts those rules initially in primary legislation. I think by contrast, if you look at the illustrative draft of the early years assistance regulations that we've provided, you will see that the first paragraph in each schedule sets out all the eligibility rules that apply for the different types of grant. So people trying to understand the legislation can find everything they need to know about who is eligible right there in the regulations without having to be concerned that those rules are displaced or altered by some other piece of legislation somewhere else. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, the committee uh, certainly is grateful uh, for the illustrative uh, early years assistance regulations uh, provided by the Scottish Government. And certainly you just touched upon them a few moments ago. And uh, as the Scottish Government recognises that the final version of the regulations, it might be different according to any comments it receives uh, about them. And similarly, a future government uh, might seek to exercise the powers in the bill in a very different way to those set out in the illustrative regulations. Has any consideration been given to uh, limiting the breadth of powers uh, with a focus on including more detail in the schedules on what regulations must or must not do? Thank you. We, we included the schedules precisely because we think it's important to ensure proper parliamentary involvement in setting the core rules that will govern, govern the giving of assistance under our social security systems. The schedules set out a mixture of rules about things that must be included and things that may be included in the regulations. As they stand, they reflect the government's view of these matters at the time the bill was introduced. Through the bill process, Parliament has complete control over the final terms of the bill, including the schedules. It is the Parliament that will decide whether further rules should be included in any of the may or must categories, whether rules presently in the may category should be moved to the must, and whether rules should be added about what regulations must not include. Uh, if I can give you an example of that, 
one of the areas that has come up already in my discussions with stakeholders, and I know perhaps in uh, so evidence to the Social Security Committee, is a concern that people um, uh, should be given assistance in kind and not f in finance, not financial assistance. Um, our uh, policy intent is that individuals should have the choice. Uh, and I think it, it is reasonable to say that there may be a case to be made to, ha to see a change in the primary legislation that makes clear that policy choice, uh, that individuals should have uh, a choice between uh, assistance received in kind or financially. I think that's an example of where, uh, as matters come forward to Social Security Committee and elsewhere, it will be for Parliament to determine whether what is currently there uh, should in any way be changed. Okay. OK, thank you for that, Minister. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Alison Harris. Good morning, Minister. Schedule 3 makes provision about winter heating assistance regulations. No mandatory provisions is made in Schedule 3, and so there does not appear to be any specific limit on what winter heating assistance regulations could provide for. Your response to the committee's written questions explains that this is because no mandatory provision is currently described. Could you please expand on this explanation by explaining why it is considered appropriate that this schedule contains no mandatory provision? OK, thank you. Um, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that there are no limits on what winter heating assistance can be used to provide for. Section 13 defines it as assistance to help people meet heating costs during the winter months. And any regulations made will have to be consistent with that purpose. I think my official's response to the committee made a comparison between all of the other schedules and Schedule 3 to illustrate that every other schedule contains what was described as mandatory provision or limits in parts of the other schedules. If you look at what mandatory provision is for, it is about defining the essence of who is to receive each type of assistance. Carer's assistance, the individual has to be or have been a carer. Disability assistance depends on the person having a disability. Early years assistance depends on having responsibility for a child and so on. At the moment, winter heating assistance is mostly paid to people of state pension age. But I don't see a reason to rule out the possibility that this may be extended in the future, as indeed we have already said it will be extended to families with severely disabled children. So that's why we haven't set the same limits on the rules for who will receive it. OK, thank you. Schedules 1 to 7 each contain a provision providing that the generality of the power to make regulations is not limited. In Schedule 3, for example, which re relates to winter heating assistance regulations, paragraph 7 states that nothing in this schedule is to be taken to limit what may be prescribed in the regulations. For the other schedules, this limitation applies to particular parts of the schedule. Given that the stated purpose of the schedules is to ensure that parliamentary control is not sacrificed in light of the regulation-making powers, please explain why this provision is necessary. OK. I think Parliament has control because if there are rules it wants to add to the schedules and make mandatory, it can amend the schedules to achieve that during the Bill's uh, consideration. Using Schedule 3 as an example is, a, is misleading. Only that schedule has no, the no limits wording because winter heating assistance has no mandatory criteria around who is eligible for help. For all the other schedules, the wording expressly says that the general generality does not ov override what Parliament agrees as mandatory provision. The current balance between which parts of the schedule create mandatory rules and which parts illustrate what regulations might provide is based on the government's view at the time the bill was introduced of where that balance should lie. The bill process allows Parliament to change that balance should it wish to. OK, thank you. Now I'm going to hand over to David Torrance. Good morning, Minister. Provision for the types of assistance will be made in regulation, which means that the Parliament will only be able to either accept or reject them in an entirety. Does this not limit the parliamentary scrutiny 
because there is no opportunity to amend the eligible criteria or what assistance is to be provided. How do you respond to the argument that parliamentary scrutiny would be more effective if provision for these types of assistance had been included in the face of the bill? Thank you. And can I, if I may, uh, add my own welcome to you, Mr Torrance? Uh, it's good to see you back. Um, Parliament has a power of veto, and I think it's a bit of a bit over overstretching the case to say that that is a limited control. Parliament can simply reject draft regulations entirely if members are not happy with what they are hearing about them, and because of that, the onus is on a government to do the consultative work in advance to ensure that any proposals it brings forward are ones that Parliament can support. That would be true even if the bill that finally emerges were to contain no express consultation requirements. But as we've consistently said, we recognise the bill should say more, uh, uh, most likely, about how proposals for regulations should be scrutinised. And we are keen to hear Parliament's views on what uh, role it should have in that process, as I outlined in my opening statement. But scrutiny of regulations is reactive, and I hope that Parliament and stakeholders will play a, pro a proactive role in influencing the design and the development of the social security system. My reference to the expert group, to the many stakeholder groups that we are engaging with, and in particular to our experience panels, I think underlines our commitment to do that. Um, I think that it is a mistake to... Uh, wait for draft regulations to be issued and regulations um, to be considered as the be-all and end-all, if you like. It is the government's job to ensure that draft regulations that it brings are regulations that have been adequately consulted on, that those views have been heard, and that Parliament does not feel obliged to exercise its power of veto. If the rules on eligibility and assistance to be given are to be contained in regulations, does the Scottish Government think there would be any merit in applying a super affirmative type procedure to regulations so as to give the Parliament the opportunity to shape the regulations and to improve them? So, if, if what we're talking about here are opportunities for people to feed into the process by which regulations are developed and drafted, to identify issues and help ensure that these are fixed before the regulations become law, then yes, I th absolutely do think that should be the case. And I think we've already taken the first steps towards that in producing our illustrative drafts of the Best Start Grant regulations. But there are many models for the super affirmative process. Uh, I, my mind is open to... Uh, considering what might be uh, the best uh, approach for this bill in this instance. But as I've said, it's not something that the government uh, can or should address on its own. I think Parliament also needs to consider its role in this space. And uh, I look forward to having a response uh, not only from the Social Security Committee, but also from Dr McCormick and indeed from this committee too, uh, I think uh, a previous appearance, I made that offer here as well. It's not just about the process that attaches to the regulations. Um, they are only a part of the picture, and we need to look more widely at the scrutiny rules in this parliament and any independent expert-led scrutiny uh, body that may be appropriate to establish. The Scottish Government's Delegated Powers Memorandum refers to the objective of proving accessibility of the rules governing each type of assistance. If the rules on eligibility and the assistance to be given are to be contained solely in regulations, what are you doing to ensure that the rules are accessible in the terms of language and availability? Hmm. So what, what counts as accessible uh, differs for different audiences. Um, what the Delegated Powers Memorandum talks about is making the legislation as accessible as possible. And I hope that you will find that the illustrative draft of the Best Start Grant regulations that we've provided is drafted in a logical order and in fairly plain English. But, it, of course, it will not be accessible to everyone. 
The need for legislation to be drafted in a way that delivers legal certainty makes that impossible. Uh, information, therefore, will be provided and made available in different formats to meet the needs of different audiences. I think we've been clear throughout that the information people need to know will be available in whatever format people need it to be in, and that we've demonstrated that um, from a year ago in our consultation and through to the work that we're currently doing with our experience panels. So I think there, in terms of what needs to be uh, legislatively clear, uh, then that inevitably will not be uh, accessible to every audience. And therefore, our intent is to provide information that is there in whatever format individuals need it to be in so that they can understand what that, uh, that legislation is saying. I think just before I bring in Polly McNeill, I just uh, want to uh, just, just to clarify kind of one point there. Uh, I know certainly uh, a number of months ago, uh, Minister, uh, you and I had a discussion just regarding the uh, provision of information uh, in various formats as I chair the Parliament's cross-party group on visual impairment. So can I just confirm then that, that uh, information will be provided in formats that for people who are blind and visual impaired will be able to access uh, the, the information about the bill? Yes. Okay, thank you. Paul McNeill. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so Section 18.1 provides for short-term assistance, and while Subsection 3 provides for those who are entitled to such assistance, there's very little limit on the power in Subsection 5 to set alternative forms of eligibility rules other than the assistance must be um, for short-term need. Um, as this power is... Uh, potentially very wide. Um, the committee wondered if there was any consideration given to either primary legislation being made to provide for other types of short-term assistance or to apply a super affirmative procedure to instruments making provision for additional eligibility rules. Thank you. I think as we've explained in the Delegated Powers Memorandum, the power to provide for short-term assistance is being taken to deal with circumstances that at present can't be fully anticipated. Primary legislation can take up to a year to change and is not, in my view, the best vehicle for dealing with the unexpected. A power to deal with the unforeseen must necessarily be broad because, by definition, the government doesn't know what situations it may need the power to deal with. On the question of scrutiny procedure, uh, as I've said, I don't want to keep repeating myself, I, I do uh, believe that there should be independent scrutiny. I do believe, and my mind is open to uh, looking at the models, the various models that are available and under the term uh, super affirmative uh, procedure, but I don't think it is the role exclusively of government to um, turn our minds to that. I do think there is an important role for this parliament particularly given the scrutiny responsibilities that our parliamentary committees have. And so I'd hope that we would be able to reach a view as a government based on views from uh, certainly the lead committee, perhaps from others and from the expert group on what we would then propose should be in the legislation by way of independent scrutiny on uh, uh, any government's exercise of its social security powers. Thank you. Can I just uh, ask just one question on that? So just in terms of having that flexibility, um, is this with, a, with an eye to, say, potential that there was a change of, uh, of, uh, of rules from uh, within, the, within the Westminster uh, powers, uh, also with the 85% uh, of uh, social security powers? So if there was a change there, then, uh, and if there were to be an effect upon, uh, upon uh, citizens in Scotland, does this, uh, this flexibility uh, that, uh, that you're talking about, does this then mean that if it was to be written on the, on the face of the bill, it would be difficult to then potentially deal with any changes? Uh, or um, am, I, am I incorrect thinking that? No, I, I think, broadly speaking, you're, you're correct, or I'd agree with you, that the, the nature of making a provision for short-term assistance is to make a provision to allow a government to deal with the unexpected. Mm. 
because it's unexpected, you can't list what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that is why it's not possible. I don't think it's sensible that you you get you create a power and then you undercut it. Um, if you say there's a power in terms of short set term assistance for these things. But what about the unexpected? That is the point. And given that we are talking about, um, as you quite rightly said, uh, convener, uh, legislation that covers 11 benefits uh, and we still will have running a UK uh, welfare system that uh, covers the majority of the spend on benefits and all of, uh, virtually all of, the employment-related benefits, then I think it is sensible for the Scottish Government to have that power uh, to provide short-term assistance in circumstances that at this point cannot be foreseen. I don't know mm -hmm. if uh, Colin or Fraser want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the constraint on short-term assistance is that it does have to be for a short-term need. So you couldn't use it to institute, you know, a mechanism to replace an entire benefit that had disappeared from the Westminster model. I think the government's clear that if you were going to create a whole new type of assistance to run on a long-term basis, that ought to come back before Parliament for proper scrutiny and consideration. But, you know, for example, if there were short-term needs arising from, say, the UK government rolling people onto UC credit and leaving them without benefits for six weeks, maybe the Scottish Government might want a power in that kind of unexpected circumstance to step in and just help people out a bit. OK. OK, thank you. Um, Alison. I would like to ask you about the top-up of reserved benefits. Why does the bill not contain provisions specifying the existing UK benefits which the Scottish ministers seek to top up? Was any consideration given to specifying the relevant existing UK benefits on the face of the bill while taking a power to amend the bill to respond to the future changes in the UK benefit system? OK. Um, the bill doesn't specify existing reserve benefits which Scottish ministers, ministers seek to top up because at present there are no plans to top up uh, existing reserve benefits. But in addition, if you were to list specific benefits that could be topped up and those were identified on the face of the bill, then Section 45 would have to be updated every time the UK benefit system changed. Uh, whether this was done via an amending power or in any other way, I don't think it's a particularly sensible use of parliamentary time to have to keep going back to amend uh, your list on the basis that the UK government has changed uh, what it's doing about benefits. And again, um, that is not something that you can sensibly anticipate what may or may not be done uh, at a UK level. At present, the power is provided to top up any reserved benefit within the limits of devolved legislative competence. So we've deliberately framed it broadly to ref reflect fully the devolution settlement. Um, I think that's clear and generally understood, although I'm happy to commit to, to ensuring that our new social security agency publishes information which explains very clearly which benefits are delivered by the Scottish Government and which ones remain reserved to the UK. Thank you. Okay. Um, Pauline? Yeah, um, you probably... Um, partially covered this, but um, I'd ask it anyway. Um, the, it's to do with the guidance on discretionary housing assistance that may be issued by ministers under Section 52.2, and that could contain details relating to a wide range of matters. Um, so these are matters in relation to other forms of assistance in the bill that are set out in the regulations, and they're subject to a particular parliamentary procedure. Um, you've given the committee a written response um, that it doesn't seem to be an appropriate use of parliamentary time to require parliamentary pool of any guidance of this type. It's the same theme, I guess. And, and that remains my view, that it is the best use of Parliament's time is to make law and not guidance. The obligation on local authorities is to have regard for the guidance which will be issued under Section 52.2 of the Bill. And that reflects the current arrangements which work well without detailed ministerial direction. Guidance isn't binding on local authorities in order to allow them a degree of scope 
to deliver services in a way that suits their particular local needs and circumstances. And I think our preference uh, would always be to allow for that degree of flexibility in terms of local delivery. However, any such guidance will be laid under Section 52.5 of the Bill, uh, which also requires a copy to be laid before Parliament, and that means that Parliament would be free to take any steps it thinks appropriate at that stage. Thank you. And, uh, Pauline? Yeah, um, first, thank you for your opening statement on uh, parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, that was very helpful. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, given the, the technical nature of the regulation, so you said obviously there's a very important role for the Scottish Parliament in scrutinising um, the regulations and the primary legislation as it goes forward. Um, do you have any view about the balance between uh, an independent um, scrutiny committee and the Parliament itself? And do you think that there's, in terms of parliamentary scrutiny or scrutiny of the the um, operation of the regulations as a whole, um, there would be any um, advantage in having some uh, cross arrangement with Westminster to use the t any technical expertise that's available there? Sorry, could you just explain what you mean by the last part about cross arrangement? Yeah, well, it, I mean, it, I suppose I'm able to ask you this in my capacity as a member of the Social Security Committee. So we'd heard um, from a, a witness talking about the Irish um, situation, and she'd said that it was worth considering whether there should be someone from the Independent um, Scrutiny Committee at Westminster um, sitting on any any committee that might be um, set up to, for independent scrutiny of the Scottish Parliament regulations and vice versa, because they're dealing with technical regulations all the time. So. OK, just on that, that last point, there, there are actually currently two members of the uh, Social Security Advisory Committee operating at UK level on the expert group. Dr McCormick, of course, um, himself as the chair, uh, and a new member recently joined. Uh, and uh, what they bring in terms of their experience of the operation of that committee uh, is, a, is invaluable. Uh, I think the situation in Northern Ireland is different in that uh, they have uh, a, um, a form of powers over the delivery of the entire social security system, uh, which, of course, we don't have. Uh, but they have... Uh, that with a limitation that, that it's not really possible to change too much between what is implemented in England and what is then uh, delivered in Northern Ireland. Uh, so I think the, the comparisons, we need to be mindful of the differences. Um, that said, I think there is value in looking at uh, how we might go forward in terms of independent scrutiny in factoring into that consideration uh, where it might be helpful to ensure that what is done in terms of social security in Scotland uh, and equally what is done south of the border uh, do not uh, contain unintended consequences. Uh, so I've said often in other places that the uh, 11 benefits that we will take responsibility for, uh, whatever it is that we do with those uh, in the immediate term or in the longer term, uh, any future government, needs to be able to work in a complementary way to the UK, what remains of the UK uh, welfare system, because individuals will uh, be in receipt at times of benefits uh, from both governments. And we don't want to get into a situation where uh, what one government does uh, creates an unintended negative impact uh, on what another government then does. Uh, and there are some issues in terms of how the fiscal framework seeks to deal with that, for example, uh, that we've, uh, as I think I said uh, to Parliament when I made the statement on the agency, we've recently resolved around um, abolishing bedroom tax at source. So I can see value in making sure at that senior level there is at least uh, cooperation in understanding and, in, and experience between whatever body we have in Scotland and uh, that uh, Social Security Advisory Committee. 
I do think, so, so we're all clear, I have always believed that there is a role, an important role, for independent scrutiny on how social security in Scotland is designed and delivered and legislated upon in the future. I think it is not an easy comparison to uh, then say we will simply do what is done south of the border for two reasons. Our parliament is different. Our committees have a clear scrutiny role that Westminster committees do not. Uh, nor do I believe it is right to have an independent body at operating at that level to that purpose where ministers of this or any government can bypass it uh, in terms of what they introduce, as is currently the case at UK level. So I'm keen to uh, reach a final concluded view, I hope, with the input from Social Security Committee, from the expert group, from this committee, indeed, if there are views that allow us, uh, before the legislation it completes its final uh, road through this parliament, to be very clear about what the independent scrutiny arrangements will be, uh, what role that uh, committee will have, and what will be the requirements on Scottish ministers in terms of consulting with it and who it might report to. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, could I, uh, I just ask one final question, just regarding the, the, the experience panels, the, the 2,400 uh, plus people involved. Uh, what role do they actually have in terms of, uh, they'll have an input role, do they have uh, a role in terms of scrutiny as well? Uh, at this stage, well, in terms of the bill, mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, at this point. Um, the, the, that is part of what the expert group is considering. Uh, so it will want to, as I think um, I said, and certainly Dr McCormick said, it will want to uh, engage with the Social Security Committee and uh, perhaps other committees of the Parliament. It will also want to consider any views from other stakeholder groups, and in that um, is, are the experience panels, and it is up to the uh, expert group, uh, which is independent, to work out how exactly it wants to do all that. OK. OK, thank you for that. Any other questions for the Minister? No? OK, thank you very much, uh, Minister uh, and, uh, and your team. Um, and I'll suspend uh, briefly uh, so we can uh, change the, uh, the committee. Thank you. Um, so the next item of business uh, is uh, instrument uh, subject to the affirmative procedure. Um, we have uh, the draft uh, Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016, Consequential Revisions Regulations uh, 2017. Uh, the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016 introduces a new type of tenancy for all future lets in the private rented sector. Regulation 5.2b amends paragraph 82 of Schedule 1 of the Letting Agent Code of Practice Scotland Regulations 2016, visiting and entering property, so that part of the paragraph reads, Section 184 of the Housing Scotland Act 2006 specifies that at least 24 hours notice must be given, or 48 hours notice, where the tenancy is a private residential ten tenancy, unless the situation is urgent. Regulation 5.2b uh, could have been drafted more clearly, Given that the 48 hours notice period is not set out in, in section 184, 
but is set out in paragraph 6 of the schedule of the Private Residential Tenancies Statutory Terms Scotland Regulations 2017, which were laid before the Parliament on the 14th of September. The Scottish Government has undertaken to include a provision to clarify this matter within an instrument which will amend the Letting Agent Code of Practice Scotland Regulations 2016 SSI 2016-133 prior to those regulations coming into force on the 31st of January 2018. Does the Committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground H, as the meaning of Regulation 5.2b could be clearer in a particular respect? And does the Committee wish to welcome the Scottish Government's undertaking to clarify this matter within an amending uh, instrument? Also, no points have been raised by legal advisers on the Draft Scotland Act 1998 Insolvency Functions Order 2017 and the Draft Legal Aid Scotland Act 1986 Amendment Regulations 2017. Is the Committee content with these instruments? Agenda item number four, our instruments subject to the negative procedure. The next item of business uh, are these uh, the instruments subject to the negative procedure. It's the Agricultural Holdings, Modern uh, Limited uh, Duration Tenancies and Consequential Etc. Provisions, Scotland Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-300. Uh, a main purpose of these regulations is to make provision for who is a new entrant uh, to farming for the purposes of whether or not a person's lease uh, of a modern limited duration tenancy, an MLTD, under the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 can contain a break clause. Paragraphs 2, 3, 5 and 6 of Schedule 2 of the regulations all make provision until the coming into force of Section 92 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 for all purposes that various specified enactments are to be read as if references to certain words as expressed within the quotation marks in each regulation are omitted. Those words are repairing tenancy or a repairing tenancy, as the case may be. It's suggested by legal advisers that the provisions uh, could be more clearly expressed if the precise wording within each enactment uh, which falls uh, to be either omitted or modified, as the case uh, may require, is quoted, so that the provision as modified reads sensibly. In the case of those paragraphs of Schedule 2 of the regulations, that precise wording is not quoted in the provisions. The Scottish Government has acknowledged that it may have been clearer to have drafted uh, the transitory provisions in the manner outlined. Does the Committee agree to draw the regulations uh, to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground H, as the meaning of various transitory provisions in the instrument it could be made clearer in a particular respect. And this applies to paragraphs 2, 3, 5 and 6 of Schedule 2 of the regulations. And does the committee agree to call on the Scottish Government to, consider, uh, to, to further consider laying an amending instrument to clarify the drafting of the provisions? Yeah, thank you. No points have been raised by legal advisers on SSI's 2017, 304 and 310. Is the committee content with these instruments? Okay. Okay. Agenda item five are instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. <clears throat> now we have uh, the following instruments uh, not subject to any parliamentary procedure are the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016, commencement number two, and Saving Provision Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-293. Uh, the regulations commence uh, the remaining provisions of the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016 on the 1st of December 2017, with the exception of paragraph 5 of Schedule 4, and makes saving provision for existing short or steward tenancies. However, no provision appears to have been made to reflect the terms of Section 79 4A or B of the Private Housing Tenancies Scotland Act 2016 in relation uh, to the commencement of Section 1 of that Act. The Scottish Government has confirmed that this is an oversight and intends to bring forward immediately an amending instrument to make provision reflecting the terms of Section 79.4. Does the Committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of Parliament under Reporting Ground G on the basis that 
that has been made uh, by what appears to be an unusual or unexpected use of the powers confirmed by the parent statute. And uh, does the committee agree to welcome the Scottish Government's undertaking uh, to bring forward an, an amending instrument immediately uh, to make provision reflecting the terms of Section 79.4? Okay. And we also have the Land Reform at Scotland Act 2016, Commencement Number 6, Transitory and Savings Provisions, Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-299. Uh, the a main provision of these regulations uh, is to commence a number of provisions of Part 10 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, the 2016 Act, uh, on the 30th of November 2017. Various provisions in the regulations make provision until the coming into force of Section 92 of the 2016 Act for all purposes. That various specified enactments are to be read as if references to certain words as expressed within quotation marks in each regulation are omitted. Those words are a, a repairing tenancy or repairing tenancies, as the case may be. Our legal advisers have suggested that the provisions could be more clearly expressed if the precise wording uh, within each enactment which falls uh, to be either omitted or modified, as the case may require, is quoted, so that the provision as modified reads sensibly. In the case of regulations 5 to 11, uh, regulation 12A uh, to J um, N in respect of Section 77.4 of the 2003 Act and Regulation 13, that precise wording is not quoted in the provisions. Uh, the Scottish Government has undertaken to lay an amending instrument before the Parliament to correct an error in Regulation 1.2 at the earliest opportunity and before these regulations come into force on the 30th of November 2017. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the regulations to the attention of Parliament? One, on reporting ground I, as there appears to be defective drafting within Regulation 1-2. Uh, a limited duration tenancy is defined uh, for the purposes of the regulations as having the same meaning as in Section 93 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016. However, the definition is contained in Section 93 of the Agricultural Holding Scotland Act 2003, that's the 2003 Act, and... Uh, on two, on reporting ground H, as the meaning of various transitory provisions in the instrument it could be made clearer in a particular respect. This applies to regulations 5 to 11, regulation 12A to J, M, N, uh, in respect of section 77.4 of the 2003 Act and regulation 13. And given the Scottish Government's undertaking uh, to lay an amendment uh, to correct the error in Regulation 1-2 and its indication uh, that it may have been clearer to have drafted the transitory provisions in the way indicated, does the Committee agree to call on the Government to so clarify the provisions uh, by means of the amending instrument? Okay, thank you. Agenda item number six is the... Uh, uh, is the <coughs> Consideration of motion S5M7795 uh, relating uh, to the Lobbying Scotland Act 2016 Reporting Procedures Resolution 2017. The purpose of the motion is to agree the terms of the Lobbying Scotland Act 2016 Reporting Procedures Resolution 2017. The legal advisers have not raised any points on this motion. Is the committee content? with the resolution set out in the motion S5M7795. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item of business is a consideration of seatbelts on school transport Scotland Bill. Uh, this member's bill was introduced by Gillian Martin, MSP, on the 28th of February 2016. The bill passed stage one on the 23rd of May 2017. Amendments were agreed by the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee at stage two, on the 28th of June 2017. The committee has before it a paper that considers a revision made to the sole delegated power contained in the bill at stage two that inserted a new subsection into the commencement provisions at section five. The new subsection requires that regulations making provision in relation to the commencement of section one may not appoint uh, a day later than the 31st of December 2018. Section 1 requires a school authority to ensure that seat belts are fitted to each passenger seat used for a dedicated school transport service. <coughs> Our legal advisers 
have not raised any issues on the amended power. Uh, does the committee agree to find the commencement power in section 5 of the bill as amended at stage 2 to be acceptable in principle? Is the committee content that regulations made under this section will be laid before the Parliament, but will not be subject to any further parliamentary procedure? And is the committee content uh, to report to the lead committee accordingly? Okay, thank you. I now move the meeting into private session. <laughs>